The last time I spoke to Dr. Bart Ehrman, the New Testament scholar, I somewhat out of nowhere asked him a question about sex and gender as discussed in the Bible. There are a lot of people today who base their ideas on what sex and gender are and what they think everyone else's sex and gender must be uh, on their idea that the Bible from the Old Testament to, you know, from Genesis to Revelation presents this absolute unified view of sex and gender. And two of the figures that they cite when saying this are, are Paul and Jesus. Uh, if, if someone was to, to bring up this idea uh, and say that the, the biblical text kind of has this unified view of this, what would be your response? Uh, it's a very complicated question, very difficult question. And part of the complication is that people today have different understandings of uh, human biology and anatomy and sexuality and gender and identity. They have different ways of understanding these things than people in the ancient world had. Um, just as an example, today, um, almost all of us, most people think that men and women are two different kinds of the same thing. And today, of course, we don't have a strict binary, male and female. Today, we have all sorts of gender and sexual identifications. And so that we, we think in terms of a range. But if you just stick with the binary that they had in the ancient world, if you just stick, for example, with men and women, we think of those as two different kinds of the same thing that men and women uh, are two kinds of human. We've got two kinds of human, men and women. Of course, it's more complicated, but two kinds, men and women. So in the ancient world, they didn't see it that way. In the ancient world, men and women were not two kinds of a human. They were two degrees of a human. Men were understood to be more perfect human beings than women. Women were imperfect males. Their muscles hadn't developed. Their voices hadn't, got, hadn't deepened. They hadn't developed facial hair. They hadn't grown their penises. The vagina was an inverted penis that hadn't popped out. And so they, they literally talk about it this way. Lots of, lots of authors talk about it this way. Philosophers, doctors, gynecologists, <laughs> yeah. so uh, religion scholars, they talk about the genders this way. If that's your understanding of gender, that women are imperfect males, um, that affects all sorts of things you believe about the relationship of men and women. Um, it affects things differently from the way we think about it, because we don't see men and women, most of us don't, think of men as the perfect human and the women as the imperfect human. Um, we don't think about it that way. And so if you, have a, if you have an understanding of sexuality and gender based on this other way of seeing things, you'll be opposed to certain kinds of relationships based on your understanding of how, how the sexes relate to each other. It'll be a different understanding from modern day. And so, so when somebody in the ancient world said that a man sleeping with a man, having sex with a man, is unnatural, they didn't mean what we mean. What they meant was, that the inferior, the, the, the person who was on the receiving end of the sex act, the man being penetrated, was behaving like an imperfect male because the male is stronger and supposed to be dominant. If you've got a submissive male, he's behaving unnaturally because he's being submissive in the sex act. It wasn't about the plumbing the way it is for us. People don't say, well, it just ain't natural because, you know, <laughs> and, and they have in mind, like, penis is the vagina. And in the ancient world, it wasn't that, is that the man who's dominant in the male sex act, if it's a male, male sex, was not behaving unnaturally. He was behaving naturally. So if you pick any tag from the ancient world and you start talking about what's natural and unnatural for sexuality, you, you've got to understand what they mean by it. And they don't mean what you mean. So that's my big, that's the big point. The second point is, um, Paul and Jesus do not talk about homosexuality at all because in the ancient world, they had no view of sexuality at all. Sexuality is an orientation. And there was no idea of an orientation as we think of it until Freud, until after well, Freud and post-Freudian uh, understandings of things. So, and those re things related to psych psychology going a little bit before Freud. So, so my point is you can't take 
a modern ideological category and think that somebody in the ancient world shared that category because they didn't have the category. It is true that Paul talks about men lying with men and thinking that it's shameful. It's also true that Paul thought it was shameful for for women to have short hair. You know, it's not natural. And so, um, you know, it's not natural for men to have long hair. Uh, and so, so these na- these arguments about Paul are based on fallacious reasoning. And Jesus says nothing about it. Now, when I have Dr. Ehrman on, I usually get some comments to the effect of, well, he's an atheist, so of course he thinks the Bible says or doesn't say X, Y, or Z. Usually I'd respond to this by saying, how about you address his actual argument or point rather than attacking him personally? But today I'm taking this on as a challenge. What would happen if I interviewed scholars of religion who have more expertise on sex and gender in the Bible than Dr. Ehrman does, and all of those scholars were Christian? Well, I spent the last few weeks seeking interviews with such scholars, and what you're about to see is the result. So, what does the Bible really say about sex and gender? A single video can only go so far in educating you about a topic like this, but for those of you who like learning about this stuff, there's what I consider to be a first-of-its-kind online conference coming up soon. It's called the New Insights into the New Testament, and it's a two-day online event that gathers 10 accomplished Bible scholars to teach and interact specifically with non-scholars. If you, like me, don't have a degree in religion or New Testament, you're the right person to attend. Conferences where scholars at this level speak are rarely accessible to anyone that doesn't have a degree in the field, so this is a very unique and important opportunity, I think, to learn. You can attend live and participate in the Q&A like I will be on September 23rd and 24th, 2023. If you can't make it live, no problem, they're recording the whole thing and of course turning it into a course that you can access anytime. To get unlimited access to this event, click the link in the description and pinned comment. You'll be helping my channel in the process, so thank you. Okay, now on to the first interview. This one will be about what the Bible has to say about homosexuality. So my name is Jeff Syker. I grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, uh, in the Presbyterian tradition, although my father uh, was Jewish, my mother was Roman Catholic, and apparently when you mix those two, you get a Presbyterian. Um, and... Uh, you know, I studied music in college as well as religious studies, and then I went on to do master's work in religious studies at Indiana University, uh, where I got my uh, undergraduate degree, and then went on to Yale Divinity School, where I got my Master of Divinity. I was ordained in the Presbyterian Church, served churches in Michigan um, before I moved to New Jersey to begin the PhD program at uh, Princeton Theological Seminary, which is uh, where I met Bart Ehrman and and we became friends. Uh, Then after that, um, I accepted a position at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, which is uh, one of the 27 Jesuit universities in the country. Uh, And I taught in the area of early Christianity, early Judaism, specifically New Testament. Um, And my expertise was early Jewish Christian relations, uh, the history of biblical interpretation, the Bible and ethics, uh, the Bible and politics. In general, I'm, I'm always very interested in um, how people use the Bible and why they use it and the way they do, why they think biblical texts mean what they do. Uh, and so I have been an ardent uh, advocate for contextual reading uh, in historical and literary contexts and um so that's that's kind of my background um i retired from loyola marymount a couple of years ago because we could sell our home in la and buy half the state of north carolina and so that's what we did you also have some popular level work on this specific issue of homosexuality in the bible right i do i've actually written um there are two books uh, that i've edited one is um, the Bible and homosexuality, both sides of the debate, where I pair uh, articles on either side. Uh, and then I also edited a book uh, that's an encyclopedia of homosexuality and religion. And uh, especially during the uh, 90s and early 2000s, I was regularly asked to give talks. 
um, about the Bible and homosexuality, and often in a debate format, I would say a friendly debate format. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so I've also written a number of articles um, uh, addressing this that have been in more popular books. All right, well, today we will go through many biblical passages that people typically use to address homosexuality in the Bible. We'll start out with Genesis and we'll work our way up to the New Testament. How does that sound? Let's have at it. Let's start at the beginning, the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, it, it's often interpreted as condemning homosexuality. In the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, there is a man named Lot who is staying in the area. He's a, a relative of Abraham's and some angels come to visit him while he's there. Although and he doesn't know that. He does not know that they're angels. He just knows that they're guests. And uh, while they're staying in his house, some people come to his door, start banging on the sides of his house, on his door, and saying some things that I think across time people have thought was rather obscene. So here's the passage, Genesis 19, four through five. Before they had gone to bed, all the men from every part of the city of Sodom, both young and old, surrounded the house. They called to Lot, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them to us so that we may have sex with them. People interpret this as rather sinful uh, because it's men, young and old, trying to have sex with men. And, and perhaps it's even worse because they're, they're male angels. Uh, what, how would you respond to the idea that clearly this is condemning homosexuality. The translation is is one question. Um, the term in Hebrew is yada, and it's the same term that's used when Adam knew his wife Eve, yada. I mean, literally it means to know, but it also has this, uh, it can have this overtone depending on the context of, of having sex. And what really uh, indicates um, kind of the sexual overtones of that story are that Lot says, no, 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 um, you know, let's not be inhospitable to these guests, but here, have my daughters, um, do with them as you please, uh, which uh, yeah, is not exactly a lot better. The real, the real issue in the story is sexual violence um, because it, it, what we're talking about is rape. Uh, whether it's rape of uh, men as a way of dominating these foreigners who have come into town, showing them who's, who's boss, or whether it's the rape of the daughters. Um, so it really has nothing to do with homosexuality per se. Uh, it has to do with sexual violence. And so what you can conclude from the passage is that sexual violence is abhorrent. And uh, I think we can all agree with that. So Lot offered his daughters instead of his, his guests there. And uh, I mean, I would conclude that if his daughters were to actually go outside, then they would be victims of sexual violence. Uh, why, why is this more, I suppose, acceptable in that context? It's not. Uh, I mean, for us, it's, it's equally bad, uh, and rightly so. In the ancient Near Eastern context, uh, Women, of course, were devalued in relationship to men. And so um, the lesser of two evils in this story is here, have do what you want with these these women, uh, my daughters, but don't violate my offer of hospitality to these men. They're my guests. And so they've come under my protection. Um, and, you know, what you do to them, you're going to do to me. Uh, so um, here, maybe this will appease you. Now, of course, uh, because they've acted in this way, uh, God condemns them. Now, the other thing to remember is that in the story before this, where God tells Abraham that he's going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, um, Abraham bargains God down. Well, if there are, you know, maybe a hundred righteous people, well, will you still destroy them? And finally, he bargains God down to 10. If there are 10 righteous individuals, and so the whole point of that more extended narrative is that Sodom is just evil beyond description, and this is merely one indication of it. And so, yes, they deserve, they deserve uh, to be uh, put to death uh, as the, these angels uh, eventually do. 
There's a very strikingly similar story in the book of Judges. Um, the this, this story is almost exactly parallel, but with different characters, except instead of a person's daughters being offered to people trying to break into a home to, I suppose, rape guests, uh, a concubine is is offered instead. And, and she is actually taken. And you can tell from the story, quite severely abused because she's unconscious at the end of it. Would you see the story similarly? Well, yeah, of course, she gets dismembered at the end of it and her different body parts get sent around to the various um, allied tribes to call them to war against the people who have done this. So, yeah, it's it's a similar story. Um, and, and so the victim is a woman and uh, the perpetrators are rapists uh, who suffer God's judgment. Now, in the context of Leviticus, I wonder if this is any different. I know that people would say, okay, well, what about the passages in Leviticus that seem to very clearly condemn homosexuality? Why can't we take that and apply it to the reading of these other stories in, in both Genesis and Judges? So in, in Leviticus, there's this thing called the Holiness Code. And it specifically says, do not have sexual relations with a man as one does with a, wo with a woman that is detestable. And also, if a man lies with a male as with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination, a uh, word that I was taught specifically, uh, they should be put to death. Their blood guilt is upon them. Yeah. Well, uh, so again, uh, context is everything. And I would, I would again remind people that the use of the word homosexuality to describe any of these biblical passages is rather anachronistic because the term itself doesn't arise until the 19th century um, in German psychological literature. So it's important that we not read our modern contexts back into uh, the biblical narratives, the biblical stories. So the Leviticus passages, as you point out, these occur within the Holiness Code. Uh, chapter 17 through 25 in Leviticus. And the Holiness Code uh, basically says, all right, you're about to enter into the promised land. And when you go into the promised land, this is how you need to behave. Uh, this is how you need to act. And you need not to act as the soon to be former inhabitants uh, acted, especially in terms of idolatry and worshiping false gods. Um, and so there are a whole slew of prohibitions uh, that you come across. Um, the, the first one in Leviticus 18.22, that simply is a prohibition. You shall not lie with a man as with a woman. It doesn't give a rationale. It just says you shouldn't do this. Um, scholars um, presume uh, or argue that, well, the rationale is this is what the former inhabitants of the land did, so don't do that. But the more serious one is in chapter 20, verse 13, that has not only the prohibition, but it also has a punishment. Um, now, directly related to this um, are other prohibitions. You shall not bow down to the god Molech, which happens in the same context. You shall not mar the edges of your beard. You shall not... Uh, uh, weave two different kinds of fabric together. You shall not plant two different kinds of uh, crops in the same field. You shall not get tattoos. You shall not do all of these other things. Um, and so the question arises, all right, um, there are all these prohibitions. Why do we say, yes, these still hold, and no, these no longer hold? Um, so, you know, I imagine there are uh, some Christians who have problems with tattoos. <laughs> One tattoo that I actually saw was uh, of the passage in Leviticus that says, you shall not get a tattoo. Um, somebody was trying to be ironic there. Um, and so that's the question. Why do some of these things apply and some of them don't? And again, the larger context is this appears to be a condemnation of a practice associated with idolatry, which is also going to crop up in the Romans passage in Romans 1. Um, and so 
um, yeah, is this talking about homosexuality? Not as we know it. Is it talking about male-male relations? Yeah. Is it condemning them? Yeah. Why is it condemning them? Well, that's the question. Um, so just because a particular sexual act is condemned doesn't mean that all such sexual acts are condemned. Uh, because in that case, if you condemn David and Bathsheba, um, and the rationale is because they had adultery, some people could say, well, you know, sex period uh, between a man and a woman is, is not right, or um, sex outside of marriage is, is not right. Um, and so you can, make, you can make those arguments, but the Holiness Code, um, I think, makes it clear that, all right, this is behavior that was practiced by uh, the folks in the land, but now that you're going into it, you are a holy people, and you should act this way. So would they have objected to male-on-male -male, uh, sex? Yeah, absolutely. Um, but the question why it's, is, I think, the most important. Now let's go forward to the New Testament. Uh, let's start with the book of Romans. This is the Apostle Paul's letter to the Romans. He says that the wrath of God is being revealed against all the wickedness that people engage in quite possibly in Rome specifically. And, and an excerpt from his letter on this says, uh, it's Romans 1, 26 through 27. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned their natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. I've definitely heard this touted as a very direct condemnation of any kind of homosexual activity, both men and women. So it's not just what Leviticus does and says male-male sexual activity is, is not okay, but also, you know, female-female is not okay. What's the response to this? Well, this is certainly the most important of all the biblical passages, and it's the one that gets used most frequently. Um, because Paul is making an argument based on natural law. Uh, now, what was Paul's understanding of natural law? Uh, well, if you look at 1 Corinthians 11, one thing he argues is that it's natural for men to have short hair and it's natural for women to have long hair. Um, of course, we might argue, well, what's natural is for everybody to have hair growing down to their toenails. Um, and so the understanding of nature becomes uh, something of a social construct. And so there are different constructs of what's natural. And so if you look at Paul's contemporaries, the Stoic philosophers had very specific ideas about what constituted natural law. Uh, and in general, they uh, argued um, that same-sex relations was unnatural and relations between uh, men and women, that kind of sex was natural. Um, some of the Greek literature uh, differs from this, um, you know, going back to Plato, arguing that um, the only appropriate uh, sexual partner for uh, an adult man is um, a youthful boy. Um, which is known as pederasty, um, you know, paida meaning the word for a, a young male. Um, and so in Greek culture, it was considered okay uh, for an older male to have a younger male lover until the time that he hit puberty. And after that, um, uh, it's no longer appropriate. So part of the question is, what would Paul have known about same-sex relations in his context? And what he would have known about would have been pederasty and slave prostitution, uh, where an owner might rent out a slave uh, uh, as a prostitute. And what mattered in antiquity, if you're a man, uh, to put it crassly, is are you on the receiving end or are you on the giving end? 
Uh, and so if you're on the receiving end um, in anal intercourse or what's called intracural intercourse where the penis is placed between the hips, uh, then you're acting like a woman. And that is seen as denigrating for a man to do. And so male prostitution, they were typically hired uh, to play the passive role. Um, and um, so for Paul, that's what he would have known about. Were there consensual same-sex relations in antiquity? I have no doubt that there were. Were they uh, widely accepted within Roman society? No, they weren't. Um, were they tolerated within various portions of Greek culture and Greek society? Yeah, they were. So, um, I mean, if you go to the, the Getty Museum in Los Angeles, um, the old the old Getty Museum, you can find vase paintings uh, of uh, depicting sexual acts between um, older men, or I just mean, you know, men who were past you know, puberty and, and younger, younger boys. Um, and men would vie for the, uh, you know, for the affection of younger boys. And so in some contexts, it was considered part of kind of the education of a younger boy to have an older man guide him in a whole variety of things, including sexuality. Um, now, Paul uh, is not happy about <laughs> such relationships. There's certainly a, uh, a power dynamic uh, at work there that we would uh, condemn. So uh, again, the Romans passage, uh, you have to take the larger context into account. The other thing is that in that passage, before the part that you read, uh, it basically is saying, uh, because people refuse to acknowledge God as God, but worshiped creation rather than creator, so they were idolatrous. And idolatry leads to immorality in Paul's book. Um, this is not an argument uh, that goes back to Genesis 1, as somebody like Richard Hayes uh, likes to argue. This is an argument about natural law. It's an argument about uh, idolatry and the consequences of idolatry. I think something integral to your answer there is something that uh, Dr. Ehrman actually brought up. And this was this idea that at the time in, in the Greco-Roman context in antiquity, there was this idea that men and women didn't represent two just different kinds of, of human. They, they more represented two degrees of human, with the male always being superior and the, the female being inferior. So he, he discussed this when it came to natural law by saying that if a woman played a male role or, you know, vice versa, then this was the thing that was seen as unnatural because men and women have this natural hierarchy. Is that is that right? That is right. Um, there's a very interesting rabbinic debate uh, that happens uh, after the New Testament's written. Um, but the rabbis are discussing um, who can be an appropriate wife for um, another rabbi, for a religious teacher. Um, if she has uh, had sex w with a man, another man, uh, that disqualifies that disqualifies her from being appropriate. Well, and then they ask, well, what if she has sex with a woman? And the rabbis respond, no, that disqualifies her as well. And other rabbis say, well, eh, what can they do? There's no sperm involved. So yeah, she can be the wife. Um, so, but yes, uh, women are considered inferior. The classic passage uh, for this is certainly First Timothy, where women are considered, uh, they're not to have authority over men. And the reason given is because they were uh, second in creation and first in sin. And so that double whammy uh, disqualifies them from having uh, authority. Of course, I, I think that's a, a really bad interpretation of Genesis 1, what most people don't realize is that Adam is not really a man physically. It comes from the Hebrew Adam, which is, is masculine, but in Hebrew, there's only masculine and feminine. There's no neuter. And so Adam comes from Ha'adamah, 
uh, which is the earth. So the earth is feminine, gives birth, as it were, to Adam, the, you know, this earth creature, I think is a better translation. And there's not male and female until God takes the rib from the earth creature and creates Ish and Isha, male and female. So you have this androgynous critter at the beginning that then becomes male and female. And uh, only after, uh, you know, the eating of the, uh, of the apple, as it were, the fruit, um, do you have the curse upon the male and female? And, and part of the curse is the woman's going to be subordinate uh, to the male. Um, so I'm not sure that's, uh, you know, it, are we redeemed from the curse or not? Anyway, so the Romans passage, yes, women uh, inferior. Now let's move on to 1 Corinthians. My uh, favorite passage. <laughs> In his letter to the Corinthians, the Apostle Paul uh, said a few things that, at least in my experience, um, translators have not always, but sometimes translated as condemning homosexuality, actually using the word. Uh, so this passage would be 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10, that says, Do you not know that whoremongers do not in inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. The sexually immoral, idolaters, adulterers, male prostitutes, men who engage in illicit sex, which I believe, at least when I was being brought up, that was what was specifically interpreted as homosexuality. Uh, thieves, the greedy, drunkards, revilers, swindlers, none of these will inherit the kingdom of God. Amen, brother. Um, so what you have there is a vice list. And... Um, all three New Testament passages uh, revolve around these vice lists. You have a vice list in Romans immediately after uh, the passage about um, men with men. Uh, this is a vice list. First Timothy is a vice list. And vice lists and virtue lists, uh, their counterparts, were very common in antiquity. And the longer the list, the bigger the club you're swinging. Um, and in this particular list, sexual sins uh, tend to stand out. And in Corinth, that's one of the problems Paul was having with them. They were, you know, there's a guy in, in 1 Corinthians 5 who's living with his stepmother uh, with implications of impropriety there. Um, they're getting drunk at the Lord's Supper. They're, they're just all kinds of problems uh, going on. Um, so this vice list, um, if you look at different translations, as you point out, they translate the Greek word arsenokoites very differently. Arsenokoites is um, a word, arson is male, and koites, we get the word koitis from that. It's um, male sex, having sex with a male. Um, and the way not to translate it is with the term homosexuality or practicing homosexuals, whatever that is, or active homosexuals, because it's anachronistic and it reads um, our contemporary understanding of consensual um, sexuality uh, and you know people who uh, discover that they are gay or lesbian it reads that back into uh the past that they are choosing to go against nature and the use uh, i mean the understanding of same-sex relations even in the 20th century uh is, is really an interesting development because it starts off being an abomination because of the biblical texts and then uh it's a it's a sexual perversion um, and it is considered a psychological disorder as well. But then in the 1950s and 60s, the language starts to shift to sexual preference, um, which is more neutral language. It's still condemned by and large, but sexual preference. And then in the 1980s and following, the language shifts again to sexual orientation, which implies that this is something that you discover about yourself, uh, like having blue eyes or brown eyes. Um, and it's not, you know, you don't actively choose uh, to be gay in that sense. You discover that you have this attraction uh, 
uh, that's not the normative uh, understanding of of you know, same sex of, of sexual relations. And so the question really is uh, is this: Is heterosexuality the exclusive norm and exclusively what God intends, or are there a variety of sexual orientations that include uh, uh, same-sex relations, that include uh, bisexuality, uh, that include asexuality, you know? And so the whole, the whole language about gender and gender norms gets brought into question here. Um, so at any rate, the First Corinthians 6 passage um, homosexuality, it should not be translated that way. It should be translated, in my view, as um, uh, uh, something like prostitutes and the men who hire them. Uh, because it says, malakoi u arsenokoite. So malakoi literally means soft. And it's a derogatory term for those in the passive role in a same-sex relationship between men. They're soft. Mollycoddling, we get that word from it. Um, and arsenokoitai, men who hire their services, men who bed them. Uh, now, does Paul know of this practice going on? He certainly knows of it in the culture at large. Is this happening in Corinth? Unlikely. It's just, it's a vice list. And he's swinging this thing around to try and, and say, look, don't do these kinds of things. And it's the exact same thing in 1 Timothy 1. Yeah, let's look at 1 Timothy, uh, because that's, that's actually my next and final passage that I wanted to look at. You see something very similar there. 1 Timothy 1, 9 through 10 says, Knowing this, the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. Is this another vice list? Would you say something similar to the last passage? Yeah, of course. I mean, that's exactly what it is. It's a vice list. And it's a long vice list, um, not as long as the one in Romans, but it's a long vice list. And it's just naming things that you shouldn't do. Um, and it again, the issue of idolatry comes up. Um, and so those who don't worship God truly are liable to, to fall into this. The other thing to bear in mind is that um, in both Corinthians and uh, 1 Timothy, it, most people think Paul is writing primarily to Gentile Christian converts. And um, their Gentile identity also comes into play here because it links them more to uh, Greco-Roman culture at large. Um, in Galatians, uh, Paul talks about we who are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. It's a very interesting expression, Gentile sinners. To be a Gentile was by definition to be a sinner because you were idolatrous. You were worshiping false gods, which then led to uh, you know, a different understanding of morality in some respects. So, um, yeah, um, context, context, context. So do you think at the end of the day that anything in the Old or New Testament directly addresses homosexuality as we know it today? You know, people are essentially born this way and that it is acceptable to engage in consensual relationships with people who are of age and outside of an, a power dynamic. Is that addressed in the text? Um, in my view, uh, not, not at all. Um, no, I remember I was, um, uh, having a debate with a guy named Marty Swords, who was a professor of New Testament at Louisville Theological Seminary. And this was before the national body of the Presbyterian church some years ago. And at the end of the conversation, uh, we were invited by the moderator to ask any questions we might have. 
And uh, Marty had ended his comments by saying, at present, he didn't see any evidence that would um, indicate that the church should move away from its historic stance against uh, allowing the ordination of um, openly gay individuals uh, or endorsing um, same-sex relations. And I said, well, Marty, uh, what would count as evidence? And how would you know it if you saw it? And he paused and he said, well, I'm not exactly sure what would count as evidence, but I'm sure I would recognize it if I saw it. And I said, well, Marty, there's a whole bunch of people here today who have come who are openly gay and uh, they're asking you to recognize them and uh, to validate their ministries. Um, there's a guy by the name of Chris Glasser who wrote a really wonderful book called Uncommon Calling, A Gay Man's Struggle to Serve the Church. And uh, he tells the story of trying to go through the ordination process as an openly gay man. And I was on a committee that eventually um, uh, denied him uh, that possibility. He joins another denomination. Um, and, and that's when I decided I better learn more about this because at the time, you know, it's not that's not what I studied for my PhD, but I decided I'm a I'm a Presbyterian minister. I'm a biblical scholar. I'd better figure this out. And so um, part of figuring it out was paying attention to people's experience. Um, in the Christian tradition, there's something called the quadrilateral, which are kind of four um, four approaches to making decisions about things. So you look at scripture you look at tradition, you look at reason, you look at experience. And so if you focus on scripture and tradition, you're gonna come out with a more conservative understanding of uh, various moral issues, including uh, same-sex relations. If you uh, look at reason and experience, you're gonna come out with a more liberal understanding uh, because you're looking at the biological sciences, you're looking at uh, studies that indicate, um, again, people don't make a, a choice uh, to be gay or lesbian. That's something to discover about themselves, as well as people's experience. What do they say about themselves? Um, and uh, Paul, and again, in Galatians, he appeals to experience, not on this topic, but uh, the Galatians are, uh, uh, interested in starting to practice Jewish law. And Paul says, well, how did you receive the spirit? What was your experience? Was it by hearing with faith or by doing the works of the law? And obviously for Paul, it's by hearing with faith. And so what do we do with individuals who are openly gay or lesbian um, uh, or transgendered or whatever? Um, and they're telling us about their experience uh, do we say, no, God can't work that way? Or do we say, well, um, surprisingly, apparently God does also work in this way. There's a great passage in Matthew 13, which is the parable of the wheat and the tares, which I think is instructive on this score. And in the parable, um, so there's the, um, uh, you know, the farmer and the uh, some people have gone out and sown weeds in his field and uh, his laborers come to him and say, hey, should we go pluck out the weeds? And he says, no, nah, I don't think so, because in your efforts to pluck out the weeds, you're going to pluck out wheat as well. And so let's just wait until the harvest comes. And at that time, I'll sort it out. And I think that's a wonderful metaphor uh, for presume uh grace presume uh, inclusion uh rather than thinking that your job is to go and root out you know the evil weeds uh, no your job is to love and to be inclusive and um in in my view i think that's what the gospel gospel calls for i wonder do you think that if you were to if you were able to speak to the apostle paul and basically reason with him in this way and say, you can look at people's experience. You can also look at if you could give him some time to understand the concept of a scientific study. 
Uh, you know, there are studies that show that, no, this is actually not something that can be changed through, uh, through any type of intervention that we've ever seen. It also seems to, to be natural, something that people have kind of from birth. Uh, do you think he might be amenable to the idea that, okay, if it's consensual, okay, if it's not a child and an adult, that, that this can be okay in that context? No, I think Paul's pretty hardwired. <laughs> I mean, you're asking, yeah, what would happen if Paul stepped into the 20th century or 21st century context and tried to make sense of what was going on in the world? Uh, first of all, I think he'd be stunned uh, that the world hadn't ended already uh, and that Christ had not returned. Um, and yeah, there's a great um, church historian named Alfred Loazi, it's a French church historian. He said, Jesus promised the coming of the kingdom of God, but all we got was the church. And, you know, I, you know, Paul, I love Paul because he's dealing with nitty gritty problems, um, dysfunctional churches, people who are you know, lording it over each other, people. And and so for me, Paul's emphasis on uh, the cross um, and God's cruciform love, as it's sometimes put, is, is very telling um, because it calls for uh, some humility. I'm not sure to what degree Paul had that humility, but um, yeah, no, I mean, we have to accept Paul for who he was. We have to accept the biblical writings for what they are. Um, and they are not God. They point to God. They, uh, they are people's efforts to um, give witness, to bear witness to what they believe God is doing in the world and in their lives. But man, they have radical disagreements about what that means, whether it's Matthew having Jesus say the law still holds, or Paul saying, no, the law doesn't hold anymore in the same way. And so um, we're still figuring it out. Um, we still have people saying the Spirit's leading us this way, and other people saying, no, the Spirit's leading us that way. So how do you, how do you discern the Spirit? That's, that's the challenge. In the Roman Catholic tradition, um, and, and I taught in that tradition for a number of years, uh, the church will make a change and then on the next breath say, as the church has always taught. Well, no, the church hasn't always taught that. Uh, in the Protestant world, if you have some radical disagreement, you just start a new denomination. It's not that hard. Um, and so that's why you have you know, churches splitting over women's ordination, over um, same-sex relations. And uh, yeah, so people, you know, I, I don't, I don't disparage people who are making good faith efforts um, with whom I disagree. Um, I'd love to be in conversation with them. Um, I would welcome that. Uh, again, and I think it's important that we not worship the book, but worship the God to whom the book points. And part of that means uh, having, uh, having an understanding of the biblical writings in their context and in the history of interpretation because people again they change interpretations over time because they're living in different cultural settings and that's that's what a more inclusive approach to uh, gay and lesbian relations does as well um, and so one of my goals is to defang these clobber texts and explain them in their context in closing do you have any work that you could point our listeners to so that they can dive into this deeper? There are a lot of resources on the Bible and homosexuality, human sexuality, and I will send you a link uh, to the resources that I think are especially helpful. Perfect. Thank you. And I will put that in the description. Dr. Jeffrey Syker, thanks again for coming on and enlightening us here. Uh, really appreciate it. Okay, I imagine some viewers have objections by now. If you read this verse in light of this other verse in a different book, or if you consider the idea that the Bible is divinely inspired or inerrant, then it means something different, etc. So, I decided to dedicate a whole interview to this. Next up, we'll dive into what methodology scholars use in studying the Bible and why.
My name is Dan McClellan. I hold a PhD in theology and religion from the University of Exeter, where I worked under the wonderful Professor Francesca Stavrica Pulu. And I worked for just over a decade as a scripture translation supervisor for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I recently left that job to focus full-time on public scholarship, and I do most of that on social media, uh, on TikTok, through a podcast called the Data Over Dogma podcast, and and I'm active on a variety of social media channels. And then uh, I'm also working on a trade book uh, that will discuss a lot of the issues that I've talked about on TikTok. Uh, and I'm also in talks with uh, some filmmakers about a, a documentary. So I'm, I'm trying to tag as many different public scholarship bases as possible. Uh, and I am a uh, Latter-day Saint. I uh, joined the LDS Church in the year 2000. I went and served a, as a Latter-day Saint missionary in Uruguay uh, from 2001 to 2003. I'm uh, living in a town called Harriman in Utah. I have uh, a wife and three wonderful children, all of whom are back in school, one of whom just started high school. So I don't feel like I'm old enough to have a child in high school, but uh, but I'm reminded uh, every morning at 6.30 when an alarm goes off that that's exactly how old I am. So i uh, still trying to come to grips with that. One thing that I've seen you do particularly well, which I think is particularly difficult also, is just explaining the methodology that academics will take in reading, interpreting, putting biblical text in, in its context and, uh, and, and taking various meanings of the of the text from there. And so I want to I want to dive into methodology a little bit. So in in your popular work you've talked about this idea of people often treating the Bible as univocal. Can you unpack what univocal means and what that means when when you're talking about that in the context of the Bible? Yeah, absolutely. That it's uh, a fancy word for uh one voice and the idea is that the Bible uh, speaks with one unified, consistent voice or from a unified and consistent perspective, meaning that a passage on this side of the Bible and a passage on this other side of the Bible represent the exact same perspective, the exact same opinion, the exact same historical understanding. In short, they are not allowed to conflict. And that arises really once the, the texts that prior to the Bible were just known as the scriptures. Uh, once they became consolidated and became, became kind of an authoritative unit, people had to reconsider, well, how are we going to treat texts that are that sit in different sides of this unit that seem to conflict with each other? And uh, ideas about inspiration developed, ideas about inerrancy would develop much later down the road. But univocality, this idea that if this all came from God, then it should all share God's single unique perspective, and so things can't disagree. And, and this serves a few different functions. Uh, one of the main ones is that it facilitates, it um, helps people negotiate with the text in a way that serves their interests. Because we, we have to negotiate with any text that we come across. Uh, there's no meaning residing in the text. The meaning is generated in the mind of a reader or a viewer or a hearer, and it's generated based on a number of, of different things. And so with the text, there are many different ways to generate meaning. And if everything has to mean the same thing, then the more problematic passages in the Bible, they can be subordinated to the less problematic passages. We can take one passage and say, well, we need to take what is stated here and that governs everything else. And so let's say we take a passage to mean there's only one God. Well, that means that all the passages that say there are many gods, we can reinterpret them to mean, oh, this is metaphorical. This isn't being serious. This is just rhetoric. And in that way, they can center and give priority to the passage that serve their interest. And that helps to push to the margins, to reinterpret, to outright ignore, or in some cases very early in the transmission of the Bible, to cut out of the text those, those more problematic passages. And so in that way, it helps to make sure the Bible always says what people need it to say. Um, and another thing that it is used to do, this concept of univocality, is to make sense of passages that are unclear.
or where they're on uh excuse me they're ambiguous we don't know exactly what's going on if we can bring in other passages where we have a better idea and say well they have to agree then they can say well based on these passages we already all agree on we can impose a sense on this other passage where we don't have a good idea and now we have increased the meaning of the text and we've made it more useful to us so there are a number of different ways in which that assumption which is phenomenally widespread. And I think in my experience, a lot of folks have n never even thought of it any other way, this idea that it is all univocal. And, and people don't realize how much they are presupposing that. If you say, well, this passage says this, and they're like, well, what about this passage way over there? It's like, that has absolutely no relevance. It was written centuries later by a different author to a different audience in a different language for different reasons. And the the assumption that it all means the same thing is just so deeply embedded in our engagement with the text that I think kind of calling that into question right from the start and just rejecting that assumption right off the bat is a, is a significant paradigm shift for a lot of folks. And I have heard feedback that it makes all the difference in the world to some people. They find the Bible a lot more interesting now that it is allowed to disagree with itself. Uh, and so it's really, I, I think it's a pretty important interpretive key for trying to understand the Bible on its own terms rather than trying to make the Bible fit the terms that we bring to it. I'm sure that there are already people watching this um, thinking of Second Timothy 3.16, which I, I might argue is the more um, commonly invoked 3.16 in, in the New Testament. There are, there, are, there are three of them that I know that are used a lot. <laughs> yeah, uh, and, and that says, of course, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for proof, for correction, and training in righteousness. I, I'd like to ask, as both a scholar and Christian, why not bring in the idea that this means that all scripture must agree with itself and that context in, you know, the context in which something was written or the culture in which something was written is maybe less important than the idea that this is all one single authoritative uh, unit of a, of a text. That That's a very common assumption. And if there were data that supported that assumption, I would agree. And, and even for folks who, uh, like people, frequently ask me, are you saying I'm, I'm not allowed to, to read this as inspired literature ever? And, and my point is, I, I'm talking about public discourse. I'm talking about things people are putting out into the public and saying, this is the way it is. When it comes to private, personal engagement with the scriptures, uh, in my opinion, go off. As long as you're not harming uh, other groups, uh, be they uh, marginalized or minoritized or oppressed groups, uh, as long as you are being constructive and productive, with your hermeneutic, which is a fancy word for your manner of interpretation, then then I don't mind that assumption. But one issue with, um, so uh, you were reading a specific interpretation of that passage, and that interpretation, that translation, actually arose within a specific historical setting. And there is a good case to make, and a case that I would argue is correct, that when that passage was written, the word there in Greek that is rendered inspired by God, theopneustos, did not mean inspired by God. Uh, there's a, there was a book uh, published a year or two ago by a scholar named John C. Poirier called The Invention of the Inspired Text, where he goes through and shows all of the times that that word and variations on that word occur in Greek literature and shows that in every instance, the meaning is not inspired, the meaning is life-giving. So literally the Greek is God breathed and the sense for the first few centuries of the transmission of the New Testament was God breathed in the sense of God breathed the breath of life into the, the human. And so it wasn't until the third century CE, there was a, a theologian named Origen, who was one of the most influential uh, early church fathers of all of Christianity. He was a few centuries later uh, declared a heretic and condemned for a, a lot of stuff. But he's the one who reinterpreted this to mean inspired by God. So God breathed in the sense of this originates in God. And so prior to around the third century CE, that wasn't the position that most people took on this passage. 
And so it's not what the author originally intended. And so I, if someone is, is wanting guidance, is seeking answers to, to questions about their personal lives, about their relationships, uh, if they are wanting to commune with God or with the Spirit or whatever, I have no issue with, with bringing those assumptions to the text. But on the level of public discourse, I think it's important that we properly situate these things and point out that that text actually doesn't say that all scripture is inspired. And even if it did, when it was written, the word scripture there refers to the Jewish scriptures, not the New Testament. And the Bible as a collection had not come together yet. So this was a reference to a very different set of texts that were considered scripture in the late first century, early second century CE. So there are a lot of ways to complicate the way that passage is leveraged by people who want to try to say, well, this means all of the Bible is from the same source, has the same perspective, uh, is equally inerrant and inspired and, and univocal and all those things. I've heard plenty of scholars that study the New Testament say that the way that scholars tend to uh, see these texts within their within their context and and the events things like miracles that that happened uh, or that are reported in the text is to interpret them as consistent with normative experience and when when lay people hear this i think that sounds very confusing uh, I don't know if it means a lot, and I'm wondering if you can break that down. When we're when we're looking at these texts, for critical scholars, scholars trying to approach this from a cr critical perspective, the idea is that we're trying to weigh historical probability. What is probable? What is plausible? What is implausible? What is impossible? And uh, we really put together arguments based on judgment calls about those those different. Uh, probabilities, plausibilities, possibilities. And the problem with things like miracles is they are uh, they are things that sit outside of our ability to interrogate and falsify and test. And in light of that, since you can't interrogate something that is a uh, an apparent miracle, then you can't falsify any claim to a miracle. And so from an academic point of view, when I look at these things, I don't accept claims to miracles, to predictive prophecy, to all of these kinds of things, because once I open that door, it cannot be shut. And this is something that a lot of devotional folks don't realize they're doing. They're being very selective in saying, with my text, they I want to allow for miracles, for predictive prophecy, for that kind of stuff, for the supernatural, but not for the Quran or not for the Book of Mormon. And so everything, all of the critical methodologies that I want my text to be exempt from, I am not going to exempt these other texts from. And so it's it's very much uh, picking and choosing who gets to be exempt from these methodologies and who does not. And, and from a critical scholarly point of view, it needs to be the same across the board. And the only way to do that in anything approximating a critical academic way is to just in a blanket way say we cannot allow for those things because those things exist outside of our methodological scope anyway and so uh, we have no way to falsify any of it and it just torches the entire uh, project to say well let's allow it here but we're not going to allow it over here and maybe a little bit over here that's arbitrary that is dogmatic, that is about structuring power in favor of one's own tradition or structuring power in a way that serves one's own interests. And scholarship should never be about that. Scholarship should be about trying to figure out what is most likely. And in order to do that, we need to be able to falsify things. And things like the supernatural, things like predictive prophecy, things like miracles, if they're allowed at all, then none of them can be falsified. Right. When you're willing to import this idea that um, it's acceptable to assume that because the text is all miraculously revealed, then even if it appears in some way to contradict, you know, one passage to another, then there is a way to harmonize that uh, because of this assumption of miraculous inspiration. And it 
you know, as you said, if someone wants to do that privately, that may be one thing. But when, when we're doing that publicly, it does allow people who just have personal interests in the text saying a specific thing in order for them to get their way or for them to be able to say, look, a divine authority agrees with me to to do that. And, and we do we do see people doing that both. I would even argue we see people who don't hold to what you typically consider theological ideas. You see non-believers saying, look, the text says one specific thing. And because this is a univocal text, that means that, you know, the, the Bible is through and through terrible. Uh, I, I I think that that's, um, that's not the greatest way to look at it uh, from from either side, right? Yeah, and and this is something that I've I've been frustrated as with as uh, frustrated with as well. I see folks who are who are critics of religion or, or of evangelical Christianity or of the Bible, who still adopt those presuppositions and methodologies. And I don't know if it's just because it's so embedded in our society that they just don't think critically about it, or if they think that in order to try to engage them on their own terms, in order to try to beat them at their own game they are required to adopt those assumptions but what i've i found that the very easy way to when folks disagree with me uh in in my comments they'll make all kinds of claims but the overwhelming majority of them will be based to one degree on, or another on an assumption of univocality or an assumption of inerrancy and that is a very easy thing to cut off no that's you're assuming that until you can provide the data or make a logical argument that does not rely on one of those assumptions, I'm not even engaging. Uh, and it's it's kind of shocking how much of the discourse is immediately uh, just invalid if you require those kinds of things. And so I, I would love to see uh, folks who on all sides of this argument, whether they are believers, non-believers, anti-believers, I would love to see them engage that a little more critically and kind of shift the discussion because it's we're still in a uh, in a place where I'm kind of the exception rather to than the rule in engaging this way which does sometimes make it a little hard for my point to get across because it's not what people are used to hearing and so they're they're more willing to dismiss my perspective as overly critical or overly anti supernatural or something like that but um, I, I think it is, from a critical academic point of view, the only defensible, the only rational, the only consistent way to approach these questions. I like the phrase that you use, structuring power. I think that's a very useful phrase. And and I, I do have to just say in transparency here, the the aim of this video is to inject some complexity into a discourse around what the Bible has to say about gender and sexuality, marriage, family, um, and it's uh, people people like to basically say, look, I have this opinion about this topic, and the Bible says this about it. Therefore, I am ultimately and transcendently even justified in having my specific opinion. And these opinions do vary. Uh, it's, there's not just one specific opinion people try to cite divine authority for in, in the Bible. Um, and I've seen this as something that you you have discussed directly on on your podcast. So I think that these conversations about the way that scholars approach uh, critically reading the text and understanding it within its own context, it could be, hopefully, people are open to it, hugely influential on the way that they see this resource as one that can or cannot be used to just, you know, it's not a trump card, or maybe it is a trump card. Yeah, I, I, and this was something that surprised me when I first got on social media because my goal was not to come to bat for a specific team. I kind of thought of myself as... Uh, coming on the field to call balls and strikes, uh, whether it was for or against the team uh, I happen to identify more with. But it's so easy for the arguments to retreat to those battle lines and for people to kind of intuitively be compelled to defend their social identities. And, and I think there are times when that is necessary, particularly when less powerful, less privileged, uh, minoritized groups are trying to fight for their identities and fight 
for their survival. I think that is necessary and important. When people become the privileged and the powerful and the oppressor, then that becomes a lot more harmful to retreat to those battle lines. Um, but I was kind of surprised that there were as many people as there were out there who were interested in seeing where the balls and the strikes were being called. Because my my assumption, and, and this is based on uh, my expertise in the cognitive science of religion, which um, which observes precisely what I just said, that we tend to kind of retreat to our social identities and to defend them if we're not thinking critically about them. My channel was kind of uh, not taking the middle ground, but being um, critical of both sides of this. And I was pleasantly surprised with how many people on all sides of these discussions were interested in that. Um, I'm, I'm not appealing to that base part of, of our intuitive cognition. And so I think I, I might have had a more popular channel had I been like, uh, you know, it's uh, everything is this way and everybody on this side is wrong and everybody on this side is right. I, I might have been uh, might have gotten a lot more followers a lot more quickly, but I, I tried to maintain some academic integrity. And uh, and to my surprise, my pleasant surprise, it has been incredibly productive, and um, I've I've met a lot of wonderful people, and I I think it is hopefully ad advancing the discussion a little bit to the point where we can rise above having the discourse just operate on those levels of of social identities. Can you plug your different social media? Any other projects that you have? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, I go by uh, at McClellan across uh, my different social media platforms, but not spelled the way my last name is actually spelled. Uh, when I lived in Uruguay, uh, I had to spell it differently because um, Spanish speakers aren't fans of, of uh, names that begin with four consonants in a row. So it's M-A-K-L-E-L-A-N. Uh, that's, that's my handle. So I'm on TikTok. I'm on Instagram. Uh, that's my handle on YouTube. Uh, Twitter threads, uh, Blue Sky. I'm I'm trying out all these uh, all these social media platforms, and then uh, uh, my co-host Dan Beecher and I host the Data Over Dogma podcast, which is available wherever you get your podcasts. And we also have the YouTube.com forward slash at Data Over Dogma, and our website is Data Over Dogma Pod.com. And we are uh, looking to to grow the the podcast. Uh, in the future so that we can um, hopefully take up a little more real estate in this discourse. So uh, we are going to be expanding here uh, in a little bit. And so uh, if you're interested in longer form content, more than the three to eight minutes that you normally see from me on TikTok or on Instagram or something like that, the podcast is is definitely the way to go. And then keep an eye out for uh, a book that uh, should be coming out at the beginning of 2025 uh, from me that will basically be talking about what the Bible does and doesn't say about a lot of the different issues that uh, are being debated uh, on social media. All right, time for our final interview, which will cover a broad range of topics. Desire, sex, gender, family, marriage, adultery, and... Uh, castration. I'm at Jennifer Wright Knust and I'm a professor of religious studies at Duke University. I'm also the director of the Elizabeth A. Clark Center for Late Ancient Studies and co-director of the Franklin Humanities Institute's Manuscript Migration Lab at Duke. Um, before I came to Duke, I was a professor for many years at Boston University where I taught in the School of Theology and in the Department of Religion and I teach um, early Christianity, New Testament, religious studies more broadly, ancient Mediterranean religions, uh, women, gender, sexuality, and religion, um, all sorts of courses like that. And if I'm not mistaken, you're also ordained in the American Baptist Church, right? Yes, that's true. Um, I was a pastor at a small church in Philadelphia many years ago now before I went to graduate school to get my PhD. So that's a long time at this point. But um, Falls of Schuylkill Baptist Church, I was a pastor there and I was ordained at my home church in Maine where my extended family lives, uh, First Baptist Church of Mount Vernon, Maine, now also many years ago. I'm, I'm not an active pastor. I don't serve a church. I um, have been a member of First Baptist Church of Jamaica Plain in Boston for a long time. And even though I'm in North Carolina now, I still maintain my membership there because I feel very connected to that particular community.
Awesome. Well, let's go ahead and dive in here. You wrote the book uh, Unprotected Texts, which I very much enjoyed. And it's not your most recent, so I am aware that you have a lot of other work uh, since then. But I, I wanted to talk about a bit that I found particularly interesting. It was these tables that were comparing what different passages in the New Testament had to say about marriage, sex, family, that kind of thing. So I thought we could dive into those. Okay, great. Let's do it. It's been a while, like you said, but um, I think I can remember what I said back then. It looks like what we have here is a few categories. Uh, the first is desire up at the top. And then we have, basically, this is comparing what different authors had to say about uh, these various issues. So starting with desire, what did the Apostle Paul have to say? Yeah, so as you probably know, there are 14 letters in the New Testament that are attributed to Paul, and among contemporary scholars, not all of those letters, um, people debate whether, for example, Colossians and Ephesians were, was, were written by Paul, and the pastoral epistles, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus were written by Paul, in part because there are differences among those letters around the question of desire and marriage and so on. So what that table and i'm looking over here because my table is over here so please forgive me if i look away i just don't want to misspeak um, like you said it's been a while since i wrote this book so i want to i know i want to stick to my table um and as that table is showing um paul in first corinthians primarily also romans and elsewhere throughout his letters assumes that desire is something that should be controlled as much as possible that um one of the things that happens if one is transformed in Christ and joins the body of Christ, as Paul puts it, is that desire no longer um, is a problem in the same way, that it's possible to control it and out of control desire um, therefore becomes a principal sign of abandonment by God, just like the control of desire becomes a sign that one has become part of Christ's body, has been fully transformed bodily by Christ. Um, so that then has certain things that follow, like don't have sex, please, if you can avoid it because you don't have desire. So it's not a problem for you. right? So why would you have sexual intercourse unless you're married? And then you should have sexual intercourse so that you can prevent your partner and yourself from um, falling into to temptation and therefore sin. Um, so that's sort of the advice in First Corinthians primarily um, and then implicitly in other letters like Romans and Galatians. Whereas in Colossians and Ephesians, there seems to be a different idea. So where Paul thinks that you're transformed in Christ, and if you're transformed in Christ, then your body actually changes and your experience of desire changes, Colossians and Ephesians locates um, the control of desire not only in Christ and therefore the divine being, but also in the context of a hierarchical household. So in Colossians and Ephesians, to control one's desire, one needs the male head of the household to help out, right? So like he has to be controlled, obviously. And if he's controlled, then the women and enslaved persons and children in his household will also be controlled. And I mean, the pastoral epistles doesn't differ. I'm gonna turn my page. It doesn't differ so much um, from that, except that in their first Timothy, second Timothy and Titus, desire is presented as extremely dangerous. Yeah, that especially for young young men who are warned that they ought to shun their passions and women who are warned that, you know, Eve was deceived first and she's the one who transgressed. So they, women better be married so that they don't get into trouble, basically. It seems to be the advice there. Pretty different from Paul's advice. <laughs> So at least it seems so. I mean, people can argue that, oh, Paul changed his mind or he's addressing a different audience. These are the kinds of arguments that are made. But whatever, whether Paul changed her mind, his mind or whether these are later letters written in Paul's name, there's a difference between what is said about desire amongst these letters. Yeah, very interesting. So I, I think when we dive into the idea of marriage, one thing that strikes me is that it, it sounds like the Apostle Paul was saying that marriage is maybe not preferable. It was something that could be used to help control desire for those who might not be strong or, or spiritually developed enough to control it without having any any sort of sexual activity at all. Am, am I on the right track there? Sure, that's exact. I read it that way too. So you must be. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. But um, that's that's how I read it too. He he seems to be very clear that. 
you know, marriage is not, don't waste your time like that. If you're, if you're married, then you're worried about your spouse. You're not thinking about the larger problem, which is that Christ is going to return soon and you need to be ready for your resurrection body. And you need to bring as many people into the Christ community as you possibly can. That's so why are you wasting your time getting married? Unless your desires are strong, you can't control yourself. Okay, fine. But otherwise, no. He even says, be like I myself am, you know, celibate. He, I'm sure, tried to be an example to emulate. Uh, comes off as a little bit uh, judgmental of how maybe other people wanted to do things. But I suppose if you're, you know, if you have the the Holy Spirit, then maybe that's something that you have license to do, right? Well, we can give him a little bit of a break because that's how people wrote letters in antiquity. So the idea that, you know, imitate me, I, I would probably write that to my son. If I wrote that to my sons now and said, you know, imitate me, they can be like, mom, are you kidding? But you know, in those days, that was actually a kind of a common way to exhort people is to be like, you should be like I am. That sounds really weird to us, but lots of other letter writers did that in antiquity. So, but yeah, you're right. He definitely thinks himself as special. He's an apostle. You know, he's, he's seen the resurrected Christ. Drew, you haven't. So sorry. <laughs> you should listen. Uh, yeah, that's, that's fair enough. I'll take that. <laughs> Now, is there more in this graph that has to do specifically with sexual intercourse that we haven't covered yet? Yes, there is. So uh, we've been mostly talking about what Paul said in 1 Corinthians. And um, if you bring in what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians and in Romans, he also seems to be saying, in particularly in Romans, that um, a man ought not to submit to um, engaging in sexual intercourse with another man if he's the recipient. Uh, can I say this on your show? Like, oh yeah, no, that's <laughs> fine. On, on like other shows, like, but I, that's what he's literally saying. Like, don't be penetrated if you're a man. I mean, I think that's what he's right. saying in Romans and in Romans one. And he's saying about women, if you're not being penetrated, you're unnatural. Yeah, which is an attitude that he actually shares with a whole bunch of writers, people writing in Greek at that time. Um, so that argument is actually very familiar if you happen to be a stoic philosopher or something. Um, that's not the attitude of everyone in antiquity by a long shot, but he's presenting one common point of view that's not Christian actually at all. Um, or he doesn't know Christians yet. Christ following <laughs> in his day. Um, there's nothing really about that in the other letters that specifically. This idea that uh, to be penetrated was something shameful if you were a man and, and natural only if you're a woman uh, was an idea that doesn't originate here. It was an idea that existed elsewhere and, and outside of the biblical text that Paul may have been lifting from the surrounding culture, right? Absolutely. I mean, he's definitely not lifting it from Leviticus uh, because Leviticus actually censures not being penetrated, but the penetrator. Uh, so that's interesting. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's move on to our next graph, which is a comparison of teachings on marriage and divorce throughout the synoptic gospels, Mark, Matthew, and Luke. So what I was trying to show, or what I hope I showed, I think I showed that these gospels don't agree on the question of whether one should um, get divorced or whether divorce is permissible and the way in which they consider divorce is very different, even though all of these instructions are given in Jesus's mouth, right? So Jesus offers the teaching, but the gospel writers don't have Jesus say the same thing. So they, so this would just be Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the so-called synoptic gospels, because they read very similarly. And there's a whole debate about why that is, but let's not worry about that for this show. <laughs> you know, Let's just let that go for now. And simply say that within those three gospels that seem to share a lot of the same sources um, around what Jesus said, they don't agree. So they all agree that um, anyone who belongs in Jesus's family is part of the kinship group, right? So the kinship group is defined as anyone who's in Christ, which given like, let's say that Paul's the earliest Jesus follower, that's not surprising. Paul thinks you become bodily part of Christ when you're baptized. So that seems to be accepted, some idea like that. Your kin are the people who are in Christ with you. Marriage Is marriage important? No, they all agree not. Why? Similar to what Paul also argues that 
since the end time is near, why would you waste your time? <laughs> you know, uh, angels don't get married. Um, so they all assume that. Should one marry? Mark doesn't care or doesn't mention it. Um, Matthew says, well, you can, but better to become a eunuch for the kingdom of heaven, whatever that means. And Luke doesn't say anything. And then finally, with divorce, this is where they're really different. Mark says, no, divorce isn't permissible for anyone, or this is Jesus saying through Mark, you know, no, divorce is not permissible for anyone. And actually, imagine a scenario where a woman might divorce her husband. Yeah. Matthew says, yes, divorce is possible for a man. Matthew doesn't assume that women can even seek divorce, but assumes men will seek divorce exclusively and that men can seek divorce if, they're, if the woman is um, accused of, of porneia, which is translated in the New Revised Standard Version as, as unchastity. We might translate it as sexual immorality. We might translate it even as, um, we might think it means that men should not um, divorce their wives unless they're not actually Christ followers. Because if you're not a Christ follower, you are by definition engaged in porneia, sexual immorality, from the perspective of the Jesus followers. I don't know what he means. Point is, there's an exception. You can get divorced. Luke says, uh, no, um, divorce isn't permissible, but separation is probably acceptable. Because you have to be separated or you leave your spouse behind in order to leave your family to preach the gospel or to share the good news of Jesus Christ. What you can't do from the perspective of Jesus and Luke is get remarried. That's not okay. So even though these are similar in their teaching, they're not exactly the same. Um, and it, it actually gets even more complicated once you start looking at what happens to the textual tradition because lots of different um, editors change these words <laughs> to try to make them in harmony or to try to make them fit or to try to fit their own understanding. Um, upshot, there's no single teaching from Jesus about divorce in the books that become the New Testament, which is reflected in the history of Christianity because there's been no one single teaching or practice among Christians around questions of marriage and divorce ever <laughs> to this very day. Yeah, there's a bit of phrasing that uh, I myself have been very much guilty of, of using, but I think most people who talk about the Bible uh, say it this way. It's, you know, what the Bible says about this or what the New Testament says about this or what Jesus said about this. And, you know, as we've explored here, uh, unless you're going to go over many different interpretations of many different variations of many different, rec you know, recorded stories, you can't quite encapsulate what the Bible says, what Jesus said, what the New Testament said, because it's it's almost infinitely variable and, and malleable depending on interpretation, textual tradition, that kind of thing, right? Well, and which Bible, right? You know, if you're a Protestant, you read a different Bible than if you're Catholic and you read a different Bible. If you're Orthodox and you read a different Bible, if you're um, Ethiop Ethiopic, you know, Ethiopian Orthodox and you read a different, and certainly if you're Jewish, you don't read this Bible. So which Bible anyway? Right. And also which version of the Bible? Again, if you're Greek Orthodox, you're reading a Greek, different Greek text. And if you're a Protestant reading the Greek text that was produced in Protestant Europe, <laughs> that's not the same Greek text at all. OK, the last thing I wanted to cover on this graph was this idea that uh, one can become a eunuch for the kingdom of heaven. I, I've heard some like queer affirming um, theologians say something like, or, or pastors at least say something like, being a eunuch kind of is a, is a broad category that could potentially be interpreted to cover LGBT people, um, you know, especially something like asexual people. But I, I've also heard stories of some early Christian church fathers actually potentially castrating themselves. Um, whether this is a legendary account or not, I'm not really sure, uh, but it, it might fall into the interpretation of this that, you know, if if a if a part of your body causes you to sin, you might you might cut it off so that you can. It's better to enter into the kingdom of heaven without it. And some people might have taken that rather seriously when it came to sexual immorality. Is is, is this kind of? Am I in the ballpark? 
according to Eusebius of Caesarea, who is a fourth century Christian writer, Origin of Alexandria, who is a third century Christian writer, who who we should, he was a tremendous scholar, like the first real Christian scholar. And we should be very grateful to him because we wouldn't have these scriptures if it weren't for him. So thank you, Origen. And Eusebius argues that, or tells the story, I should say, that Origen in his youth castrated himself, but then later realized that he should have read Eunuch for the Kingdom of Heaven allegorically, not literally. That in, in among the, um, the Christian writers of the third to the fifth century and even beyond, um, taking a text literally was a really bad idea, despite what Protestants do, you know, later, much, much, much later. But earlier on, like that was the dumb way to read a text, right? You should read it metaphorically. You should read it looking for the spiritual meaning. And so Eusebius uses the story about Origen to say, wasn't he awesome? He really cared, but he really kind of made a mistake and let this be a lesson to you people. Don't, don't castrate yourself. Were other people doing that? I don't know. I mean, I think we don't know historically what was happening there, but it's possible that people read it that way. People were incredibly, were willing to do a lot of things. I don't know. And I mean, it's also worth noticing that from the perspective of um, some Roman writers, Roman era writers, both in Greek and in Latin, um, people who, who, who circumcised themselves were castrating themselves. That was considered disgusting from that perspective. So circumcision itself was censured who knows what Matthew really meant? Um, there's many ways this has been an inter interpreted. One interpretation that I find especially persuasive is the idea that Matthew is referring back to the prophet Isaiah, who argued that at the end of time, eunuchs will approach the temple and God won't say to them, you're a dry tree, but they will be welcomed fully into the community of people worshiping the God of Israel in Jerusalem. So if that's what's meant, then I think that, you know, LGBTQ affirming pastors have a really good argument to make about how um, if part of what the Jesus message is saying is that we ought to live like we're in anticipation of the end times. And if the anticipation of the end times means that what your genitalia is looks like doesn't really impact whether or doesn't at all impact whether you're welcomed into the community of God's people. Um, that's a great interpretation of that, of that verse that I think you could defend quite well if you wanted to. It's certainly not the only one, but it's a good one, I think. Okay, let's move on to, I just wanted to ask you a question about Galatians 3.28. This verse says, there is no longer Jew or Greek, there is no longer slave or free, there is no longer male and female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. Can you tell me about the, the context in which this was written and, and the various interpretations that it's, it's had over time? So I think I want to say, first of all, that I encountered this verse and the um, feminist interpretation of it when I was at seminary many years ago now at Union, Union Theological Seminary in New York, and that interpretation was deeply moving for me. Um, and, and I would support it still. The idea that somehow um, what, what this writer, you know, Paul's arguing is that our, our bodily and our political and our social differences are not what matters to God. Good, yeah. But you're absolutely right that this verse has a context, that it's framed, and often, you know, verses 27 and 29 are dropped when just 328 gets brought up. And what Paul says is that those who are baptized into Christ Jesus, in other words, you have to be in Christ Jesus first, yeah, get to experience this reality, and ends by saying, if you are in this reality, you're all part of Abraham's offspring, in other words, or actually, literally, you're one of Abraham's seeds, <laughs> or, you know, you're in Abraham's kin group. Um, what does Paul mean? Well, he seems to think that we're somehow living in these transformed, resurrected bodies and that these bodies are judged not on the basis of our um, embodied differences, our political differences, our social differences. And yet, in all of the letters of Paul, whether they're attributed to him by modern scholars as really being Paul or not, difference is constantly maintained. Right? So, um, women, according to 1 Corinthians, have to wear something over their head when they're praying and prophesying um, in 1 Corinthians 11. And Galatians is all about if followers of Jesus who are not Jewish 
uh, try to get circumcised, they are in fact violating the good news. He wants the Greeks to stay Greek. He wants the Jews to stay Jews. He wants enslaved persons potentially to stay enslaved. He wants free people or is happy that free people are free, men to be men, women to be women, male to be male, female to be female. And yet he anticipates a time when that doesn't matter. How do we live in a time with that kind of idea? Let's anticipate a time when it doesn't matter, even as we live in these differences that are quite hard. I mean, he's telling enslaved people that they're one with their free owners. Really? Thanks. <laughs> you know, so it's a hard saying, actually, even though it was tremendously life giving to me when I was in my 20s. <laughs> I, I can understand and have a lot of empathy for that perspective on the assumption that uh, none of us are long for this world, that, that Christ is going to establish his kingdom on earth very soon. You know, it might, it might be a waste of time to try to change your social status if, if really what you need to be doing is, is preaching the gospel and just trying to reach as many people as possible. Um, so I can understand that very much in, in that context. Well, at least part of what the verse signals is that, you know, human beings are really good at turning what they perceive to be differences, whether they're differences in gender and status and religion or nationality, and I'm looking at our own context, right? And turning those differences into reasons to break us apart and to produce divisions among us so that we cannot find common ground. This is a human specialty, <laughs> you know? So maybe what a, a positive message in the verse is, that is harmful. We have to somehow maintain our differences. I don't want to be anybody else than my identities that I've claimed. I'm not going to stop being that. But that doesn't mean that I'm not human, you know, with you, Drew, or with other human beings who are different from me, younger, older, whatever, you know, in our own context, racially different, nationally different, whatever. Um, how do we manage difference is a problem that engages all human beings and all human beings who are people of compassion and goodwill who want justice have to figure out a way to deal with them better. Yeah, I definitely see that. That is a very powerful message, so the, the way that you put that. More recently, you've done work on this very famous and, and somewhat infamous story of the woman caught in adultery, which is found in the Gospel of John. Now, there's a lot of controversy around the originality of that story. Um, I can see why a lot of people would want the story to be original and why people might think that the story is not in fact original. Can you can you unpack this for me? So I think one thing I learned working on that story as long as I did, and believe me, I worked on that story too long. <laughs> like I know so much about the history of the transmission and reception of that story that you don't want to get me started. We'll be here until, you know, 24 hours from now, we'll still be discussing it. So but one thing I learned from that is that the question of whether the story is original, in my view, is the wrong question. That's the wrong question, because what does that even mean? What is original? What that story does is remind us that even the gospel books, or especially the gospel books, because they're so well-loved and often read, they're constantly changing, not only by way of interpretation, but also the very text itself, so that people's understanding of what gospel is is actually written into the books that transmit the gospel itself. And that story is just a perfect illustration of that principle. Um, so it reminds us, or at least calls me, to take responsibility for what I'm claiming in, to be a gospel story. It suggests that gospel stories were so much more than whatever's even in the gospels, which is clear once you go down that rabbit hole and you start reading other kinds of surviving Christian texts or texts that become Christian, that survive from, you know, the third to the sixth century, it, there's a lot bigger story than what becomes the New Testament there. So we could go down that rabbit hole too. But if nothing else, it reminds us that the books that we have are in fact material evidence for what we regard as the gospel. And that material evidence changes all the time. So just the very idea that this has stuck around, that this has been a part of the reproduced uh, text of the book of John. I think it, you're saying it, it tells us something about what, not only what the gospel is, what, but what we want it to be, and that what we want it to be in some way is what the gospel is, right? Exactly. Well said. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm, I'm glad. Maybe, uh, 
I maybe I need to enroll at 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 Duke and and take some more classes because I'm learning a lot. Just you already got it, so I don't know. Maybe you don't need to. <laughs> the fourth and fifth century Christian writers, Didymus the Blind, uh, Jerome, and Augustine, knew perfectly well that the story didn't appear in copies of Gospel of John and all of them, and yet they liked that story and they were perfectly happy to interpret the heck out of it. And that practice continues to this day. And that's part of what I showed is that there was a story in Protestant New Testament textual criticism as it developed in Europe, that that story was not um, told in Greek, in exclusively Greek Orthodox context. But as my, my co-author Tommy Wasserman and I showed, that's just simply mistaken. Um, that in fact, the story was also well-received and well-loved among those who received the gospel in Greek exclusively. Um, what they remembered is that um, some people knew it wasn't in, in the, in the gospel, in, in every copy, and they would retain that just like they were retaining the notes of, of scholars from the past, like we might read scholars from the past and try to remember whatever they taught us. And so they did remember that it was not always in the gospel, but that doesn't mean they didn't read it as gospel. There's a common practice a kind of across a the divide when it comes to issues of, of sex, marriage, gender, this kind of thing, when it comes to the Bible, uh, people will just, they'll, they'll start with an idea and then they'll invoke the Bible as just kind of an ultimate authority for what they're saying. Either they'll say, this is what the Bible says and it agrees with me. Um, of course, they're, they're using their own interpretation in order to kind of make it say one specific thing that agrees with them. Or conversely, uh, they might say, the Bible says this, which is very bad, and we need to throw it out because it says something, you know, kind of so awful. Uh, what I see here with this story is a serious challenge to anyone's ability to do that clearly, um, because you can... If, if you're trying to say, oh, the, the biblical tradition has always been very draconian, kind of gross and sexist and, uh, and unforgiving, um, that's very much challenged by this story, the, the, just the mere existence of this story. But also, because it doesn't appear to be something that was um, in the earliest uh, copies of, of the Gospel of John, it shows that early Christians, Christians throughout history have valued this story and its message of forgiveness and, and love over um, even justice and, and punishment. Uh, it shows that, no, they've, they've actually had quite a, what we consider today to be an enlightened view on, on these issues. So I, this is a fundamentally very challenging story, I think, to, to narratives that are rather harsh uh, on either side of this, you know? I mean, I love the story for that reason, but I don't love the story. I have a, a friend of mine ask me why you you know you must love this story you've been writing about it for so long I'm like yeah I don't like it at all <laughs> and here's really? what I don't like about it I like the, of course you know um, you know those who've not you know without sin throw the first stone great but what it what the story imagines is a scenario where Jesus is an a, an interpreter of the law debating with other interpreters of the law some manuscripts have them. Um, simply Jews, some have them scribes and Pharisees, whatever, whoever they are. But Jesus, the legal expert, is in debate with other Jewish legal experts, is that is a setup of that story. And the woman is the silent ground upon which the law is debated. And frankly, that is not satisfactory to me. She should have gotten up and left. Now, I could offer a different interpretation. There's nothing in the story that does, tells me not to that says that Jesus and the woman were in cahoots. You know, he gave her a little wink, wink, like, I know what this is about, lady, you know, you, let, you and I are going to show these guys, right? But there's nothing in the story that actually says that, right? So what ends up happening is that men decide women's fate. Now, Jesus's decision is a lot nicer than what the other men decide. He tells her to, you know, go and sin no more. But we don't even know. What do you mean sin? Like, what did she even do? Do we even know? No, we don't know. And with the Susanna story or something in the background, you may not know what I'm talking about, but that was another really super popular story during the time in which this story was being told about another woman who was actually, in this case, wrongly accused or set up um, as having committed adultery for the sake of some men who were terrible. Doesn't matter. Point is, the woman is not given a voice in this story. She's, she's never asked, what did you do? Why did you do it? And I find that really unacceptable.
and maybe I can argue the story invites me to find it unacceptable. Again, my mind is kind of being blown here. <laughs> I, I think I've I think I've grasped it, and then and then you you drop something that makes me like totally reframe my own perspective. So I appreciate that. Well, there, there's a great tradition in um, some in many Greek Orthodox manuscripts, which would become that is retained in many Greek Orthodox Bibles to this day, where the men leave the one who accused her one by one because of their consciences. In other words, their consciences. Um, you know, are pricked. And so then they realize that, oh, whoever's without sin throw the first stone is really in, they're indicting themselves and they, they think of their own sin then. And I like that reading because then it's like an invitation to, for self-scrutiny. What is it that I've done before I go around telling other people what to do? Now, you will be speaking at this online conference called the New Insights into the New Testament Conference. It's hosted by Dr. Bart Ehrman, and there's going to be a whole bunch of different scholars that will be speaking, uh, yourself included. Uh, what I like about the idea of this conference is that it is, you know, by prestigious professional scholars, but it's really for people who don't have a background in this. It's for lay people to be able to consume and I think that this is hugely important because, like I've said, the the Bible is just kind of touted as an authority for whatever the person already believes a lot of the time, regardless of what it is. Uh, can you tell me about your role in, in the conference? What are you going to be talking about? So I'm going to be talking about the story of the woman taken in adultery, and um, we'll have a chance to look at some of the manuscripts that contain it and some of them that don't. And we'll talk about the way that um, that story has been interpreted and um, we'll do a, like a literary analysis of what various meanings of it might be. And but then really delve down into this question of how notions of sexual sin change, how gospel texts change and what that tells us about how human communities understand themselves in relationship to one another and God. So that's in a nutshell what I'm going to talk about. And I'm super excited myself. I'm such a fan of, of the, all the people speaking. I can't wait to learn from them. I'm really excited. I do have to say, you know, like full transparency, I am an affiliate for this, so I, I get a little bit if you sign up for it and it supports my channel, which I appreciate. But I also will will just say that uh, for what you're getting for this conference, for the amount of speakers that you have and the amount of content, it's actually priced like <laughs> very affordably, I think. Um, I've, I've signed up for things that are more like two or three lectures, uh, you know, outside of outside of what Bart does, and it's cost me like double what this conference costs. So uh, I, I appreciate all of you being willing to get out there and do this and, and for Bart making this very accessible to, to people. So, you know, go sign up, help me out, but also go learn something most importantly. We've talked a lot about the biblical text in the New Testament not being so affirming of of exploring and embracing you know desire and sexuality and, and different kinds of bodies and, and things like that uh what stands maybe in contrast to this is uh songs of solomon a am i wrong in thinking that this is something that celebrates the the beauty of of romantic and sexual love i i, I was taught that this was so obviously a story about a young married couple. But since, since you know, growing up and reading it on my own, I, I'm not so sure if that's the case. Uh, can you unpack this for me? I mean, the Song of Songs, I think you're absolutely right. It's incredibly erotic and it uses erotic language um, to provoke a response in the reader for sure. And there, you're absolutely right that there's no explicit marital context for this at all. In fact, the the woman and the man seem to be sneaking around trying to see each other in a context where there is no in, in institutional sanction for what they're doing. Um, so I don't know where the marriage is in that, but it's certainly been read as a wedding song and it has things in common with Mesopotamian wedding songs. So it's playing on that idea. Um, and I certainly, in my own context, in my own life, heard it's read at weddings, you know, so it can certainly be read that way and has been. But what really um, struck me as I became a scholar was how that particular reading was not the least bit interesting to the interpreters um, of this book that I study. So from the perspective of um, 
Christians, I'm talking Christians now, sort of third century forward Christians, as well as rabbis, sort of third century forward um, Jewish rabbinic interpreters, the Song of Songs was about the love between either the soul and God or some corporate body like Israel and God, or even the prophets and God, or the church and God. So it's the entire book is a metaphor for how much either Israel desires God or the soul desires God. And it's so, they're so creative with how they read the book because in this imaginary, right, the woman is the rabbis or the woman is the soul or the church seeking after the God who is then envisioned as the man in the story, yeah? But then they can flip it. And so you'll have examples in, in the medieval period of like nuns imagining themselves being nursing at the breasts of Jesus. I mean, once you just get rid of the idea that you have to read the text literally, all bets are off. And it's about how desire can inform us theologically, which is really different from also what I was taught, but incredibly interesting and opens up a whole other way of thinking about what that text would be about. That's fascinating. You can, you, if you are not committed to reading this literally, which as you've said, many have historically not been, uh, it's kind of, it seems a little bit more of a, a modern, uh, fad to, <laughs> to do that. Uh, you, you can quite easily fit this in with your own interpretation of, you know, that, uh, chastity is, is, is great. And we need to be chasing after maybe even a kind of like ascetic, uh, existence where we are saving ourselves for spiritual things and, and putting our minds onto something higher. All of our, uh, the pursuit of our desire should all be spiritually focused, not like carnally focused. Um, so, but um, of course, it seems like you could interpret this in a way that directly contradicts that at the very same time. Exactly. Well done. I think that's right. I think that's right. And it doesn't necessarily, it doesn't undermine marriage and it doesn't, all, it also doesn't support it. It's not about marriage. It's about desire. And it's about two, two things, two beings, two somethings desiring. So what are the somethings? And what are they desiring? And what are the circumstances? Well, it's a poem. I mean, poetry is not, invent, is not meant to be read literally. Poetry is an invitation to sit together and contemplate um, what's possible and what beauty is and why it's beautiful. And that's not about enforcing a law. Final question here. Uh, we've talked a lot about the differences and teachings about sex in the Bible and commenters will <laughs> undoubtedly say things like, uh, you know, if we, if we stop inserting or injecting our own assumptions about the biblical text, um, then we can interpret all of these different things in a way that all harmonize. You know, there, there's clearly not actual significant differences or discrepancies uh, across across different texts, whether it's in the Hebrew Bible or the New Testament or in different Gospels. How, as a professor, do you respond to, to this idea? I'm sure that it comes up in, in classrooms, right? Yes. So, um, I mean, first, there is no such thing as reading without a context. And I can prove that to my students if I need to. Like, and I wouldn't use scripture to do it. I'd do something else, like anything. It could be like Duke's mission statement. You know, it doesn't matter. Like, there's no reading without a context. Um, that's number one. And number two, the idea that the the Bible, again, as we say, which Bible, right? But that the Bible is in harmony about anything, that is already a principle that's being brought to bear on the collection of scriptures that one holds. And the scriptures are being forced into that perspective, yeah, that I am going to make stuff harmonize. You can do that, but in the process of doing that, especially if you engage in a literal reading, you're flattening the scriptures and the various books and, all, and the various things that books say in order to fit your theory of harmony means everything has to say the same thing about X, yeah, in a way that's making you miss the the complexity and the fascinating beauty of these very ancient texts. Um, and why would you want to do that, I guess, would be one question I have for you. Um, it's possible. Maybe we could think about harmony differently. 
I mean, I grew up singing in choir. I don't know about you, but I did. And uh, to harmonize means every, to, to really harmonize well means everybody has a different part. Yeah. And so there's a whole choir of people and we don't want the sopranos to try to sing bass. I mean, that would be ridiculous. If I tried to sing bass, I would sound ridiculous. So why are you forcing these books to try to sing a song they're not singing and making this music sound terrible? Stop it. You know, that's not what it means to harmonize if you're insisting on a har harmonious scripture. So I think I could argue from my tradition, I said I'm American Baptist, that yes, I mean, we're we're a Bible-based tradition, yeah? But we can still argue that our, that our scriptures are in harmony without forcing them to say either what we want them to say or forcing them to say one thing. It's a terrible mistake. And no American Baptist can do that legitimately if they're claiming their own tradition, in my view given the kinds of positions that American Baptists have taken historically in all sorts of issues. But that's an argument that I can have in my denomination, and I don't need to bother you with that one. It seems to me as, admittedly, you know, kind of an, an outsider to this, it, it really doesn't seem that you have to sacrifice um, the importance or the beauty or even the idea of inspiration of the Bible uh, in order to see the various contexts and, and you know, if you want to call them contradictions uh, in scripture. But the, the thing you do have to give up is just that it is a very clear and concise authority that backs up what you already believe. That's the thing that you actually have to give up, which for some people may be more difficult than giving up the idea that the Bible is inspired or, or beautiful in the first place. No, I agree with you. I mean, I don't know how you feel, but, you know, the world can seem really out of control, <laughs> especially right now. We were we were talking earlier about how I just got back to North Carolina from Maine, which is where my family lives. And I was told by a friend that this summer is being called Hell's Front Porch because it's been so hot, you know, whereas in Maine, it's been so cold and rainy that the pond that my family has a cabin on, the water is up to the very edge of the dock, which never happens at this time of year. Like usually it's really low. So everything is upside down, topsy-turvy, it feels out of control, and that's just the weather. So I can understand why people might wish that scripture would just like tell them, but it just doesn't. It just doesn't. And, and in fact, his claim that it does is to shirk our responsibilities to work together to try to discern how to live in the world. Um, and that, I think, you know, if I dare have a theological moment would be what I think God wants us to do is to try to work together to figure out how to live justly and walk humbly together to try to solve something like climate change or climate weirdness or whatever you want to call it. Because we're not, if we don't do anything, you think it's going to get any less out of control than it is now. So scripture's not going to solve that. We have to do it. Well, I will very gladly walk with you on that one. I, I appreciate your your takes today. Thank you for informing and educating us, myself included. And uh, yeah, I, I'm excited to watch your talk at the conference. Thank you, Drew. It's been such a pleasure to, to meet you and to talk with you today. And thank you for your wonderful work. Um, we have a, There's a lot of scholars who are huge fans of you and your work, just so you know. <laughs> so to bring this back to the beginning of the video, was Dr. Ehrman right about sex and gender in the Bible? And does a person's religious label matter more to their scholarship than the methodology they use? I'll leave that up to your own interpretation. Thanks for watching. I've been Drew of Genetically Modified Skeptic. Thanks again to all the wonderful scholars who helped me out with this. I'd also like to thank Chris Huntley, marketing director for Bart Ehrman, who did a lot to put me in contact with my interviewees. A final thank you to my patrons for their constant love and support. Remember to sign up to the New Insights into the New Testament conference. If you want to hear more from me, then subscribe. As always, if you are an apostate in need, there are resources linked in the description to help you find community and mental health support. Remember to be kind to others in the comments, and until next time, stay skeptical.